Welcome back to Harbor Unbox. Today we are taking a close look at the new Intel Core i5-12600K, the only Elder Lake CPU that we get to look at, at least of the CPUs that Intel has announced so far. Now, priced at $320 US, what we have here is a direct competitor to AMD's Ryzen 5 5600X, which is currently selling for $310, so slightly above the $300 MSRP. Now, whereas the Ryzen 5 5600X packs six cores with 12 threads, the Core i5-12600K includes six P cores with four E cores for a total of 16 threads. Now, the P cores, they can clock as high as 4.9 gigahertz, while the E cores are capped out at just 3.6 gigahertz. So clock speeds are very similar to that of the 12700K. There's just 25% fewer P cores, though the E core count does remain the same. The L3 cache capacity has also been reduced from 25 megabytes down to 20 megabytes, so that's a 20% reduction there. Other than that though, the two are very similar. So given that the 12600K is coming in almost 30% cheaper, it is set to be a cracking good deal. The rest of the specs also remain the same, so that means 20 PCIe lanes from the CPU, 16 of which are the new PCI Express 5.0 specification, and again, both DDR4 and DDR5 memory technologies are supported by the integrated memory controller, though of course not simultaneously and not by the same motherboard, so you'll have to pick in advance which memory type you wish to use. Stock memory support though does include either DDR4 3200 or DDR5 4800, and recently I looked at DDR5 6000 performance with the Core i9-12900K and found that for the most part, this new high speed memory offers very little in the way of extra performance when paired with an Elder Lake CPU. And this led me to conclude that for just about all potential 12th gen customers, they should ignore DDR5 and just go with DDR4. That being the case, I'm not going to invest time testing the 12600K with DDR5 memory, given the memory itself costs more than the CPU. If you want to know what that memory technology delivers for Elder Lake, then do please check out my 12900K review. As for the motherboards, I've gone with the MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4 for testing the 12th gen Core Series processors in this review. Now, due to the hybrid core design of Elder Lake, the 12600K, along with most of the 12th gen processors, will require Windows 11 and its improved thread scheduler for optimal performance. That said, they do work just fine with Windows 10. Sometimes performance isn't quite where it should be, but we're not talking about significant differences. But that being the case, I have tested using a fresh install of Windows 11 for all of the CPUs in this video, and that includes all the Ryzen CPUs. So all the data featured in this video is fresh and has been collected over the last few weeks. The Ryzen test system uses the ASUS ROG Crosshair 8 Dark Hero motherboard with the latest BIOS revision, and of course, all the latest Windows updates and drivers have also been installed. Finally, the last test system note worth mentioning is the fact that all application and gaming data has been collected using the AMD Radeon RX 6900 XT graphics card. Okay, that should just about cover everything. I think it's now time to dive into the results. Starting with Cinebench R23, we find that the 12600K is in a completely different league to the 5600X, delivering a whopping 63% more performance, and in fact, it even beat out the 5800X. We're also looking at a 61% improvement over the 11600K, which is a mighty impressive generational leap, even if we are taking into account that 23% increase in price. The single core performance was also exceptional. Here it still beat the 5600X and 11600K by a 26% margin. Again, that is a massive generational uplift. It also means that the 12600K should comfortably beat the 5600X for both multi and single core workloads. Having just said that though, the 12600K and 5600X are very evenly matched in the 7-zip file manager compression test, though this has been one of the weaker results we've seen for the 12th gen CPUs when looking at the 12700KF and 12900K for example, so no real surprises here. And then when it comes to decompression performance, the 12600K and 5600X are again very evenly matched, and that meant the new Core i5 processor was 23% slower than the 12700KF. Again, the 12600K proves that it's in a completely different league, this time in the Corona benchmark, where it offered 48% greater performance than the 5600X, as it took just 86 seconds to complete the render, the exact amount of time it took the 5800X. So, as I said earlier, you're really getting next-tier performance with the 12600K. 
Now, for content creators, the 12600K offers exceptional value by delivering almost 40% more performance than the 5600X, and it even outscored the 5800X by a 16% margin. We're also only talking about a 13% decline in performance when compared to the 12700K. So again, an exceptional value here for content creators with Intel's latest Core i5 part. And next up, we have Adobe Photoshop. And here the 12600K was 11% faster than the 5600X, as it was again able to match the 5800X. It was also just 7% slower than the 12700KF. So the 12600K is shaping up to be the sweet spot in terms of price to performance for Intel's 12th gen lineup. We see that the 12600K remains dominant over the 5600X in Adobe After Effects, providing 17% greater performance, and that was enough to see it beat the 5800X by a 5% margin. We're basically looking at 12700K levels of performance, making the 12600K one of the fastest desktop CPUs for this workload. Factorio is a new addition to our battery of benchmarks, but this simulation game hasn't been included with the rest of the games, as we're not measuring frames per second, but rather updates per second. This automated benchmark calculates the time it takes to run 1000 updates, and this is a single thread test, which apparently relies heavily on cache capacity. As you can see, the Core i5 performs exceptionally well here relative to the 5600X 5800X, and in particular, its predecessor, the 11600K, which it beat by a 27% margin. Moreover, it was just 6% slower than the 12700KF, so another stellar result for the new Core i5 part. The 12600K is also a beast when it comes to code compilation performance, smashing the 5600X by a massive 57% margin, making it just 19% slower than the more expensive 12700KF. We're also looking at a 43% generational improvement over the 11600K, so it kind of sucks if you bought one of those any time in the last nine months. Of the last application benchmark that we're going to look at is Blender, and yet again the 12600K proves it's in a completely different league, smashing the 5600X by a massive 44% margin. Once again, the new Core i5 processor is comparable with the 5800X and last generation's 11700K. Now, a massive problem for the Core i9 12900K was power consumption, though we found this was far less of a concern for the 12700K. Well, with the 12600K, it really is no concern at all, as this processor pushed total system usage 46% higher than the 5600X, but it also delivered 44% more performance, so in terms of efficiency, they're about the same. Moreover, the 12600K matched the performance of the 5800X, and here we see total system usage is roughly the same, so Outer Lake's power efficiency is far better than we first thought. Now, when it comes to cooling, I've used the Corsair IQ H115i Elite Capelix for our temperature results, rather than the bigger 360mm MSI model used to cool the 12700KF and 12900K. Using this more modest 240mm AIO, the 12600K peaked at 71 degrees for the package and 72 degrees for the cores, and these temperatures were reported in an enclosed Corsair Obsidian 500D case in a 21 degree room after 30 minutes of looping the Cinebench R23 multi-core test. So that's a very reasonable temperature that makes the 12600K comparable to the 11600K or 5800X, and it also means with a 240mm AIO, we do have some thermal headroom for overclocking, and this is something I will explore in future content. Okay, it's time for the all-important gaming benchmarks, and we're going to start with F1 2021. And again, for all of this testing, we're using the Radeon RX 6900 XT, typically with dialed down quality settings at 1080p. So here the 12600K enabled 373 FPS on average, with a 1% low of 260 FPS. When compared to the 5600X, we find that the 12600K is a bit of a mixed bag, offering 5% stronger 1% lows, with 5% slower average frame rate performance. Overall though, performance is much the same between these two processors, along with the 5800X and 12700KF. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege, the 12600K is less impressive here, despite pushing up near 400 FPS at all times with an average frame rate of 511 FPS. Basically, this meant AMD's 5600X was 10% faster, though how much that even matters is hard to say, given all CPUs tested were capable of pushing extremely high frame rates in this game. 
The 5600X and 12600K delivered basically identical performance in Borderlands 3 with no more than 2 FPS separating them. Both were quite close to extracting the most amount of FPS possible from the 6900XT under these test conditions, so needless to say performance was excellent. Moving on to Watch Dogs Legion, we again find the 5600X and 12600K are very evenly matched when gaming. This time the Intel processor was faster by just a 3% margin. So again, much of a muchness here. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy is pretty heavily GPU limited with these higher end CPUs, despite the fact that we're testing at 1080p with an extremely fast graphics card using the second highest quality preset. But I do feel that results like these are important to include because despite the unrealistic test conditions that aim to highlight CPU performance, we find the game is still very much GPU limited and this is important to note as the vast majority of games out there will be GPU limited, especially when using a relatively powerful CPU. Anyway, given that the 5600X and 12600K are able to max out the GPU, performance is basically identical using either CPU. The Shadow of the Tomb Raider results are far more interesting as this is a very CPU intensive title and like what we found with F1 2021, the results are a mixed bag. The 12600K was 4% faster than the 5600X when measuring the average frame rate, but 5% slower for the 1% low. Still performance overall was much the same and you're certainly not going to notice any difference between these two CPUs. Hitman 3 is also very CPU demanding, but again, if you have a 6 core 12 thread processor from the past few generations, you've got more than enough processing power to avoid any frame stuttering issues with well over 100 FPS for the 1% low. That being the case, the 12600K crushed it with 166 FPS for the 1% low and 192 FPS on average, making it 4% faster than the 5600X. So again, basically the same gaming performance from these two CPUs. Where the 12600K really excels is in Age of Empires 4, and here it was almost 20% faster than the 5600X, and that's a major performance improvement. It also meant the new Core i5 part was a good bit faster than the 5800X and 11700K, so a really strong result here from Intel. Previously though, I did make the mistake of suggesting this title could be hinting at future performance margins between Zen 3 and Elder Lake, but regrettably I was completely wrong about that. After closer inspection, I've discovered that Age of Empires 4 is a single threaded game, so these results are more indicative of performance of older games like StarCraft 2 for example. Basically what we're looking at here is the strong single core performance of Elder Lake. The 12600K was 26% faster than the 5600X when measuring single core performance in a Cinebench R23, and we're seeing that translate to an almost 20% win here. But for the most part, games do look like what we're seeing here in Horizon Zero Dawn, and that is to say the performance difference between the 12600K and 5600X is virtually non-existent. The 5600X was 5% faster when comparing the average frame rate, but 3% slower for the 1% low, so again performance is virtually indistinguishable, or really it is indistinguishable. And last up we have Cyberpunk 2077, and again this is another game where the results are mostly GPU limited using the latest generation CPUs from AMD and Intel. In fact with Intel you can probably go back a few generations for 6 core 12 thread processors or better. That means the 12600K and 5600X are comparable in terms of performance, though the Core i5 did offer 8% greater 1% lows. Now when it comes to power consumption for gaming, there's very little difference between the 12600K and 5600X as the Core i5 processor pushed total system usage just 4% higher, which is obviously a negligible difference. And finally, here's the 10 game average, and as expected overall the 12600K and 5600X are very evenly matched, with the Intel CPU up to just 3% faster. So at least when it comes to gaming, it doesn't really matter which processor you use, and really both represent the best value for gamers from their respective lineups. Okay, so that's how the Core i5-12600K performs, and damn, Elder Lake keeps getting better the further down the product stack we go. The Core i9-12900K, that was decent, it traded blows with the Ryzen 9 5900X and 5950X, but it wasn't a clear option over either of those parts. Then the Core i7-12700KF, that was a great alternative to the 5800X, and really is my preferred choice given the often significantly stronger application performance with typically better results in games. The Core i5-12600K continues that trend, in fact it does even better relative to its nearest competitor, the 5600X. Worst case, the 12600K was only slightly faster than the 5600X in single and multi-core workloads, 
but it was often much faster and the performance improvement offset the extra power usage. So power consumption isn't an issue for the 12600K and it's certainly not crazy. Any cooler capable of keeping the 11600K or 5800X in check will work just fine with the 12600K. Then when it comes to gaming, the 12600K and 5600X are very evenly matched, especially in modern games that utilize many cores. Where the 12600K has a real advantage though is for older games, like what we actually saw in Age of Empires 4, that really only tax a single core. Here the superior single core performance of Elder Lake is put on full display, boosting frame rates by around 20%, again as seen in Age of Empires 4. So looking just at the CPUs, the Core i5-12600K for $320 or the Ryzen 5 5600 for $310, I've got to say there's basically no way I'd go with AMD if I were building a brand new system or upgrading my platform. Obviously, if you have a Zen Plus or Zen 2 CPU and you're looking to boost performance, the 5600X is a decent option and really by far your best choice, short of the 5800X or 5900X, for example. But for those of you starting over, I'd personally ignore Zen 3, especially at the current prices. The only hiccup for the 12600K right now is motherboard pricing, and that can swing the value equation in AMD's favor at least until cheaper 600 series chipsets arrive. Right now, the cheaper Z690 board I'd consider is the Gigabyte Z690 UD DDR4 at $200 US. And really short of any actual testing, it's still a bit of an unknown quantity, that motherboard, but I hope to address that soon. Then for the 5600X, there are a number of cheaper motherboard options, such as the X570 Tough Gaming Wi-Fi, which can be had for $190 US. Not a huge saving there, but then of course we do have B550 for that. Assuming you're happy to drop PCIe 4.0 support for 3.0 from the chipset, there are a good number of quality B550 boards priced between $110 and $150 US, such as the MSI B550A Pro, uh, the MSI B550M Bazooka, ASUS Tough Gaming B550M Plus, MSI B550 Gaming Plus, MSI B550M Mortar, and the MSI B550 Tomahawk. So mostly just MSI B550 boards then, not sure what's going on with pricing and availability from ASUS and Gigabyte, but we do know from first-hand testing that those MSI boards are very good. The MSI B550M Bazooka for $130 is probably one of the better quality options there, but I also really do like the MSI B550 Tomahawk for $150, and I think it is well worth the extra $20. It's also a better matchup for the Gigabyte Z690 UD DDR4. So in that example, AMD is $50 cheaper on the motherboard side, and that means overall the 5600X plus B550 package is $60 cheaper, though we're only talking about a 12% discount when combining just those two parts. That said, we could opt for the MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi, which would make the AMD package almost 20% cheaper. So this certainly does tip things in AMD's favor when it comes to the value equation. Well, sort of. Remember, prior to the release of Elder Lake, I wasn't even recommending the Ryzen 5 5600X. It's just not a good value part at $300 US. In my opinion, it needs to be more like $250 US at most, a $200 US if AMD wants me to recommend it over anything Intel has. And the reason being, if value is your focus, then grabbing the Core i5-10 400F for just $180 US really is the way to go. Throw it on the $100 MSI B560M Bazooka, and you've got a great gaming combo for less than the price of the 5600X. So if you're on a tight budget, that very clearly is the way to go. But if you've got another $200 to spend on the combo, I'd go with the 12600K on an entry-level Z690 board, or hold out for the cheaper B and H series chipsets. In my opinion, Intel really does have AMD in a bit of a tight position at the moment. Of course, AMD does have many options, so it will be interesting to see how the red team reacts, if indeed they do. For now though, the Core i5-12600K is my go-to CPU at the $300 price bracket, and that is going to do it for today's review. If you did enjoy the video, then hit the like button. You can subscribe for more content because we'll be doing many more big head-to-head -head benchmarks with Zen 3 and Elder Lake and investigations into stuff like Elder Lake memory scaling and disabling e-cores and uh, maybe some resizable bar testing comparing both platforms. A lot of stuff coming up on the channel, so make sure you are subscribed for that. Also, if you would like to support the channel and allow us to buy other CPUs when something like maybe the 12400F finally comes out, uh, we'll be able to buy that and you know all the other stuff we do on the channel. So to do that, Patreon or Floatplane, 
yeah, the two things, the links for those are in the video description and you will get access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams with two and myself. We can ask us questions live. We will be doing that later this month. Uh, Q&A stuff, behind the scenes content, a lot of cool things there. So if you're interested, interested links for those are in the video description. But yeah, I'm going to get some some rest. It's been a long slog over the last two weeks getting the three main Elder Lake Day 1 reviews done. Very happy to have it done and very happy to see that we have some great competition in the CPU space. So that is always exciting. That's going to do it for this one. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.